The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. If you're looking for thought leaders on global equities, Nick Griffin from Munro Partners is one investor you should follow. In this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, I chat with Nick about his career, about the Munro investment philosophy and investment process, how they distill and refine the world down into just a manageable list of global equities. Then we dive into themes such as the three themes that Nick and his team are interested in right now. He outlines the theme itself, how they find it, and the companies that are interested in that sector or expression. We talk about Taiwan, China, chips, and ASML, a somewhat unwieldy business, but one that many investors follow quite closely. We also conclude with a discussion of why Nick has so much cash sitting in the fund. Nick was recently quoted in the AFR as having a significant cash balance, so we dive into what Nick may be waiting for before he redeploys all of that capital. If you're interested in global equities and really interesting long-term companies, this is a fantastic episode. To start things off, I asked Nick, if you could pick just three financial metrics from a company's financials, what would you include? Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on. It's uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I've seen you present a few times, never spoken to you in person, and everyone that I speak to says really good things. So Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure. Once again, I thought we'd start off the show with a few quick fire questions. Yeah, go for it. So the first one is if you could pick just three financial metrics, ratios, however you want to cut that up, what would they be? Uh, yeah. So for us, it's, it's, it's revenue growth, like miles ahead, number one. Okay. Um, we are growth investors. The reality is to be a growth investor, you have to grow. Best way to grow is to grow your revenue. Yeah. Um, Below that, we'd, we'd point to earnings per share or cash flow. Um, either of those two, I'm gonna, mm-hmm. here you go, I'm gonna cheat. Uh, but earnings okay. per share and cash flow, you know, you have to get your revenue to turn into earnings is number two. And then, and then the third one for us is debt. Okay. Um, you know, the reality is, is if you're doing it with a lot of leverage, that, that can be quite dangerous. Uh, yep. So two are about opportunity and one's about risk. It's, it's good that you picked revenue, actually. And it, it makes sense with the growth focus, but uh, a lot of investors that come on the show, I guess, neglect that maybe because they're more focused on the deep value, that type of thing. But almost all the academic papers that I show, if you're a long-term investor, revenue growth is a key, uh, it's a defining factor for our performance. So I think that's Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, in this day and age, you can't build a business being profitable day one. Mm. You have to have a great concept that grows revenue that eventually becomes profitable. Yeah. Great examples over the years would be Netflix. Mm. Uh, great examples into the future might be Uber, uh, but but if you haven't got revenue, you you, you haven't got a business. Mm. Fair enough. This is more of a personal question. The next one: If you could fish any spot in the world, where would it be? Ah, uh, yeah. So so for me, yeah, well, I do fish. Uh, look, I'm a fly fisherman. Uh, okay. Uh, so for me, uh, and it is a hobby. I'm not a very good fly fisherman, okay. I'll be honest. But uh, for me, you know, I could paint you a picture. You you're Tasmania, um, out in the Western Lakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's Thousands of lakes out there. Uh, there's one called Tin Hut, uh, Tin Hut, which that I've hiked into with a friend lots of times. Uh, if you get there early enough in the morning, you can stand on a big rock and you can actually see the fish oh, wow. uh, in the water, and you can see the fish, and you can go down and cast to them. And it's just it's just a big rush. It's a big buzz. Um, it's it's probably my favourite spot. 
Great, great place to clear the mind, fresh air, fresh water. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 because you can see them or Polaroid them, um, it's um, it's 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 super exciting. You can actually see them come up and decide not to take it or go for a loop, come back and then take your fly. And it's, oh, it's wow. really exciting. Wow, that's actually. I was actually looking at uh, Pat Dorsey, the author and investor from the US, and uh, is it Pat Dorsey that also has written fly fishing books? <laughs> and so I was confused I was, when I was looking this up. I was thinking, wait, is this fund manager also a fly fisherman? But here we are. We're in the flesh. We've got a fly fisherman and someone that uh, Yeah, but look, importantly, the problem with being a fund manager is you're, you're probably always on the whole time. Yep. Um, and so your hobbies are generally things that occupy your mind, so you don't have to think about yep. Yeah, I like it. Um, someone that came on the show once before said that he thinks of his best ideas in the shower. <laughs> and uh, clearing the head is a, is a great thing for an investor. So the next one is, if you could spend an hour with any CEO or founder, who would that be? Uh, look, look for us right now, it's probably Jensen Wong. Um, you, some people might know who he is. No, I don't uh, know he's the founder of, of NVIDIA, okay. um, oh, yeah. which we think is... Um, you know, is 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 a, is a leader in artificial intelligence and and where compute power is going to go. Uh, I'll probably end up talking about a bit about this today. But and Jensen is the founder of Nvidia. Um, he's he's the guy who could tell you how the world's going to look ten years from now, and he'd probably be the closest to being right. Mm, okay, great to know. Um, okay, last quick fire question is: if you could hand a newer investor three books, one, two, or three, however many you got, what would they be? Yeah, so from my point of view, I don't actually read a lot of investment books. Yep. Um, I, I get that investment books are helpful, but they're all going to – everyone's got their own way of making money, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, and I'd encourage the listeners to find your own way. Yeah. You know, there are other people's ways. You can look at it, take it on board, but but find your own way. Um, my way is honestly to understand industries. So if you understand an industry well enough that's structurally growing, then 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 that's what I do. So the books I read, um, you know, the, the, the second machine age, which was – you know, written all the way back in 2014 or 2013, but helped me understand how digitalization would work. Um, the Great Disruption is is was written all the way back in 2012, helped me understand how climate change would work from an investment point of view. And then mm. um, and then Ray Dalio's book Principles yep. helped me understand how to run a good funds management business. So yep. those those are the ones that I, I would point to. That's a great list, and um, I think uh, as you evolve as an investor, I think you get a bit more. Um, choosy in the, the books and how you spend your time and what you read. So I think those are, are, are great. I've never had anyone on the show who's mentioned those. So that's a first. <laughs> Let's now jump back to, to you and your story. Yep. Did you have any entrepreneurial streaks when you were younger? Um, no, not massively. I mean, yes. I mean, look, I, you know, when you get into finance, you know, you always want to be able to run money. And, yep. and so you always have a view that you'd like to be able to run your own fund at some point because that's how you get to run your own money mm -hmm. with no one telling you what to do. Yep. Uh, so, so that entrepreneurial streak's been there since, since early in the start. But when I was much younger, um, yeah, no, generally, you know, I like to try and make things happen. Um, I'm, that's, you know, I, I get agitated if things aren't happening. So I'm, I'm that sort of person. But whether I, you could call me an entrepreneur, I'm not sure. It's really just to get to the point where you can run money the way you want to run it. Mm. Well, this is, it's actually interesting because I tend to see when managers come on the show, there are entrepreneurial streaks or tendencies, even if they don't take a lot of risk early on in life, they have a kind of curiosity about business, uh, about investing and just basically how things work. Can you, did anyone, when you were younger, like family members or friends, did anyone, does anyone spring to mind when you think about that, like how things work and people teaching you or influences? Oh, look, so 100% that's my dad. Yep. <laughs> so my dad was a fund manager yep. um, and he got me into investing very early on. Um, I grew up in an age where lots of businesses in Australia were privatising. So, you, you know, it'd be some people remember, but, you know, Commonwealth Bank privatised and then mm. Qantas privatised and then Woolworths IPO'd and then Telstra privatised. And these were great businesses that just needed to be run in the private sector and they were huge free kicks as an investor. And so mm. I invested in those in my teens and, you know, had good results. And then, yeah, my dad was a fund manager. He travelled a lot. He got to meet lots of interesting people and we'd always discuss this stuff a lot. So so definitely been a huge influence on that side of things for me. Yeah, great. How about your career, Nick? Um, you know, you've been at some pretty prestigious firms or places. You're kind of straight out of the gates. As you look back on your career up until Monroe, are there any profound moments or uh, influences or even market environments that you can recall? Um, yeah, there's lots of good ones. Um, 
I look. I started as a in an Australian funds management firm called CBA, um, which ended up turning into Colonial and and covering Australian stocks. Mm. Um, and I did that for about three years, and then did what most Australians did at the time and threw away a perfectly good job and and put a backpack on and went travelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, from my point of view, I just always thought that going away overseas would and you know again this was influenced by my father <laughs> um, would help you discover you know all these new businesses, all these new ideas. Um, for me, when I worked at Deutsche Bank as an oil and gas analyst in Edinburgh, um, you know, that was a very profound time for me. Um, I got to meet great fund managers like Bally Gifford, like, like uh, Artemis, like Walter Scott in Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. And, and Munro, if you don't know, is, is a bit of a, is a Scottish word for mountains, so a bit of a homage to those oh, businesses because okay. I thought they, I just really liked the way they did it. Uh, but also I was, I was a broker at that time. I was an analyst, so I was on the sell side. And so we, we, we got to go to Libya, Kazakhstan, Russia, <laughs> Um, you went to some fun places, saw some really cool things and, and just really learnt how the system worked. Um, and so those, those years in Edinburgh when, in my 20s were, were, were quite profound in terms sort of setting up what, what we wanted to do mm. in the long run. Do you, do you look back on that time and think now, oil and gas, like were there any, was that insightful or was it more counterpoints? Or like, do you, I, I should probably know the answer to this question, but do you, explore oil and gas as an investment industry or do you kind of screen that out or yeah no so if you're an oil and gas analyst back then oil and gas was the biggest sector in the market you know yeah, we, right. we're the biggest company in the world was exxon and mm. we covered it the biggest company in the world was in the uk and the well, biggest companies in the world were bp shell and total and you know you got to meet the ceos um you did their road shows um hmm. so we were the big dogs back then you know tech was just this is like 99 like tech was just with the new kids on the block yep. um so, yeah, we were the most important people at the firm. Uh, we were number hmm. one rated oil and gas team in the world. Um, and so it was great fun. It was just a really good time to get access to a lot of very interesting things mm. um, and go to some amazing countries and just see how the world worked. It was interesting. I think I heard you say before that uh, you've invested through five market crashes. Uh, one of those would have been the GFC. Yep. How about that environment? Do you reflect on that now and have some lessons learned or has that informed your process or your philosophy today? Yeah, so 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 five. I said five five bear markets. There's been two bear really markets, bad yeah. ones, being the tech crash where I was at Deutsche, and and the GFC. So maybe if you just go back to the tech crash <laughs> just quickly, you know that was interesting because you know we saw like basically two thirds of the staff get sacked around you. Um, yeah. So that was a profound experience because you know a lot of people left, um, and so from my point of view. Being able to hang on to your seat was quite important in that period, and, and mm. it's something that people should think about if they're in this industry trying to hang on to your seat. For sure. Um, the GFC, I was with K2 here in Australia, um, and that was that was different. That was um, that was it, it was it was basically a little bit like what we're going through now is just to realise you know how bad things could actually get, mm. um, and and for us you know at the time you know Campbell Neal run K2, he was very very good at being very pragmatic about just saying, we just got to step to the sidelines here, guys. You know, it's a right. difficult environment. You know, he came up with these things like stop losses. Stop losses worked very well, um, something we inherited and used for the rest of my career. Uh, just being really pragmatic about recognising it's a difficult environment, just stepping to the sidelines. You may have made a mistake here and and to get out of the way. And that was my profound experience of the GFC because the GFC, like, you know, it started bad, but it just got worse and worse <laughs> and worse. And you, you you underestimated how bad it could get. Did you think on the way down that, well, we're at the bottom, we're at the bottom, or surely this thing's got to turn? Is that what you were thinking on the way down? Yeah, I think we tried to pick the bottom about eight times um, (laughs) and had to back out. Yeah. Uh, And on the ninth time, we got it right. Um, So, yes, (laughs) we felt like that the whole way down. And you would put capital to work, but you just, again, that pragmatism would come through of just let's just actually know it's not, let's get out of the way. Yeah. Um, And that was was the GFC for us and and, and that – you know, at KT, we did, we did very well. Um, the, the drawdowns were small. Um, and I, I, like I say this a lot to people, I remember, you know, it was a less than a 20% fall peak to trough, yet the market fell 50. Hmm. And then the next year, you know, you made 35. Um, so, so you don't have to pick the bottom. You just got to recognise sometimes it's raining and that, you know, sometimes you play cricket and you win, sometimes you play cricket and you lose, and sometimes it's just raining. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was the big lesson of the GFC. It was just raining. Yeah, I like that analogy. Um, let's skip forward a little bit to uh, kind of the origin story of Munro. How did that come to be? Yeah, so I, I sort of talked a little bit about the time in Edinburgh and, and looking at a lot of those fund managers. So once you get into financial markets, um, for me at least, you know, the goal was always 
to try and get to mm. running your own firm or running your own fund within a firm. Um, that's your goal once you're a fund manager. It's, you know, you want to be able to, you know, prove that you're good at it, um, mm. but also, you know, not have people tapping you on the shoulder saying you have to sell that or if you don't sell this, you're going to lose your job, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Um, so that was always the goal. And then it was like looking at other people's businesses, studying them and deciding, you know, how a good funds management business is run. I talked about Ray Dalio's book. I talked about yep. the people we saw in Edinburgh. Um, how do you run a good funds management business? And then and then what, how do you want to run the money? That's that's really where the concepts came mm. from. How, that's actually a, a, a good thread that we should pull on is how, so what are some of the things now that you, you've been through this process, what are some of the things that you did well and maybe you could have done differently? Yeah, so from my point of view, the thing we did well is we, we built a partnership um, at Munro. So people might realize this, but but the partnership is modeled off a business like called Bally Gifford in the UK yep. or, or Wellington uh, in, in Boston or, or even Bridgewater, Ray Dalio's business. So it's, it's a partnership. And so the partnership allows us to get people to come in and we give them equity in the, in the company. Yep. Um, it allows them to be aligned exactly on the outcome of the, of, the, of, the, of the business. And if they leave, they just give their equity back. So they get it for free, they give, give it back for free. Mm -hmm. um, everyone at Munro has the goal of being a partner and, and my founding partners, most importantly, were not other fund managers. Um, mm. So Ronnie Carvett, uh, is the CEO and John Spencerley is the CEO. So, so what a lot of people miss about funds management businesses is they think it's all about running money. It's not. Mm. It's about how do you run a good business? How do you attract good staff? How do you do good compliance? Mm. How do you do daily pricing? How do you do daily pricing with an ETF on the exchange? How do you communicate with your investors? Like all these things people don't think about are actually really, really important to running a good funds management business because in the end of the day, your clients are giving you money. They need to trust you. It's the most important thing that they've got next to their family is their money. For sure. They need to trust you. And so they need that, that infrastructure around them to trust. And then when they give it to you, they're going on a journey. Uh, you know, our tagline at Monroe is invest in the journey. And that journey is going to have twists and turns. It's going to have ups and downs. And you need them to leave the money with you to trust you for a long period of time so you can give them the outcomes that they're looking for. And, and that you, you're not going to be able to do that with just performance. Mm. Um, there's so much more to it than performance. You seem to communicate really well too. Yeah. Is, um, and you mentioned that as like a, a core kind of pillar of that. Um, is there any, I guess, is there anything that you do that you would say is kind of helps you stand out amongst the crowd? Because you seem to communicate really well. You tell good stories. I've seen you at events. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, look, for me, I've, I find, you know, a lot of people can make running money really complicated. I think it's incredibly simple. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, we, we, do, we try to do a good job of saying that. Uh, but importantly, it's the team who are also, you know, building the websites, creating the videos, you know, providing opportunities like this for us to tell our story. Uh, but importantly, it's important to tell the story. Like a lot of fund managers try to be really, you know, we don't want to tell you what we're doing. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you what I'm buying. Yeah. There's a veil of secrecy. We can't show you the secret source. That's great, but as soon as you stuff up, you know, you have a bad month, people lose trust and they'll take your money out. Yeah. And, and, and that doesn't help you as a fund manager because money's leaving right when you should be having money coming in. Mm. What you're trying to do is build trust on that journey, which for us is double-digit returns through the cycle on a three- to five-year view, you know, more than 10% per annum after all fees and expenses. That's what we're trying to do. We've done it for 16 years. Hmm. Okay, we've done it for 16 years. And I can assure you it's not a straight line, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got twists and turns and bumps. And so if you can communicate that properly to your clients, then they will trust you and they'll have a good experience and then they'll tell their friends. Yep. Um, and so that's why communication is important to us. For sure. How about now if we switch gears to investment philosophy, if you could give us kind of the, the bird's eye view of how you invest, um, and then we'll maybe drill into investment process and how you go about screening, filtering, building a portfolio and all that from there. Okay, so the bird's eye view from the top is that, you know, as I said at the start, earnings growth drives stock prices. So yep. earnings or cash flow growth, whichever one you want to choose. Um, so we generally find that companies that make more money every year, their, their share prices go up. Mm -hmm. um, from our point of view, when I started this job, you know, you could, you know, when you're doing Australian equities, you know, you're over underweight certain sectors, you're overweight certain companies. That sort of makes sense in Australia. When you're doing the whole world, that's a waste of time. Yeah. Um, you may as well just go and try and find the best companies in the world that are going to grow their earnings for the longest period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and the way we do that is to just identify big structural changes in the world, whether it's digitalization, whether it's decarbonization, whether it's um, healthcare, whether it's e-commerce. And so where are the big structural changes and where are the big winners going to come from um, out of that? And so what you'll find, and every, you know, I could tell these stories all day, mm. but you know, smartphones came along in 2008, everyone got a smartphone, you know, one company won, Apple, mm. and 10 lost. 
search engines were a cool thing. There were 11 search engines when I first started, found the internet. <laughs> Ask Jeeves, you know, yep. um, Alta Vista. Yep. Uh, Yahoo, in the end, Google wins, okay? So find the big change and then find the big winner. That leads you to the, the double-digit returns you're looking for. And that leads them to that double-digit earnings growth, which will actually give you the double-digit return. So that's our philosophy. Um, and, and, and lastly and most importantly, just remember it's a world of very few winners, okay? So not all companies can do this. In mm. most scenarios, 90% of the companies that are in the right area are losing. Mm. So just lastly, most importantly, recognize that on your journey to find these great companies, you're going to make a ton of mistakes. Mm. Um, and, and, and just accept that. I think that's, that's yeah, really sage advice. Let's, let's drill into that then. So, you know, you've got maybe nine out of 10 don't win. How do you go from the universe, which is the whole world for you, and then break that down into, you know, 40, 50 stocks, yep. you know, how do you get from that to this and what's your watch list in between? Like, how, let's, let's get into that. Yeah, so from our point of view, what we started doing all the way back in 2005 um, when, I, when I was at K2, you know, that back then, they, you know, it was like, here's some money, you buy yourself, cover the whole world. <laughs> and so we started building a universe of these areas of structural growth. So, so we call them AOIs. Yep. And so like one is climate change. What are the companies that are leveraged to decarbonisation? We found about 50 companies. Mm. Uh, E-commerce, what are the companies leveraged to that? We found about 40. And so this built a universe. And so we have 20 of these AOIs that we, we would call structural growth areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that builds up a universe of roughly 1,000 stocks. So that's 1,000 stocks. So we've got it down from 34,000 to 1,000. Okay? <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> and then you, and then what we'll do to the guys is we'll we'll talk to a lot of companies and try and work out which ones are accelerating right now. And so the one that's accelerating right now is clearly decarbonisation. The one that was accelerating three years ago was, you know, digitalization, yep. digital transformation, and before that it was the internet, etc. Yep. And so then we will say these are the areas we want to be in right now. We don't have to be in all twenty, and we'll get the wonderful team at Monroe Partners to build bottom-up models on the companies. And the bottom-up model on the company is just a simple hypothesis that basically says we think this company is in the right area. We think its earnings can double. If its earnings double and its multiple stays the same, then we think its share price can double. Yep. Um, and we want them to be able to double within five years, which is a 15% per annum return. Mm -hmm. And so then we do the bottom-up work. That gets us to about 50, 40 or 50 companies uh, across maybe five or six different areas of interest. And then the last and most important bit to remember is, is, is you know, if you've got the mass right and the stock's earnings double and the multiple stays the same, then share price is going to double. Mm. So it either works, which is great, or we got the mass wrong and it wasn't the winner. You know, it was the BlackBerry or the Yahoo the situation. <laughs> yeah. And then we have to recognize that and make a mistake. So there's one of two outcomes. Or well, the third outcome is you get shaken out along the way because something happens that, that you lose trust on. Those are the three possible outcomes for our bottom-up ideas. How, like, if you uh, could maybe summarize some of the reasons why companies have fallen out recently out of the portfolio, or, um, some examples of maybe if it's not like, it doesn't hit the thesis or something you know has gone wrong or there's some sort of rules, predetermined rules that you guys use to... Um, say we will we will exit the position if. Yep, hundred percent. So yeah, when we when we enter a position, we we would actually write down before we enter the three things that could go horribly wrong. So okay. we can go back and read them and go, wow, this is one of the three <laughs> things that could go horribly wrong. Yep. Um, so some good examples of things that so so importantly, some of them just hit their price targets, right? So yep. some of them just get overvalued. So last year, a lot of companies we like, like Atlassian, which we really liked. And we still like, or or, or even HelloFresh that we like, and we still like, you know, just hit their price target. They got overvalued versus the opportunity, and the opportunity was going to get complicated, so we stepped to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So that's the first reason. That's that's a good reason because we made good money on both those companies, and they have fallen since then. And we'd like to buy them back at some point. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that go wrong? Good example last year would be Alibaba um, and right. Tencent. Um, so, you know, so. We, we thought Alibaba was the Chinese Amazon. Mm. You know, we love Tencent for its gaming business. You know, they were big positions in the fund. Um, we made a lot of money out of them um, since 2015, 2000, and sorry, 16 when we started. Um, but, you know, the, the, the anti-PO was delayed. Mm. That was the first sign something was wrong. Um, and we run these things called stop losses. So if any company falls 20% from peak or from cost, and as I said, we inherited this from our previous firm, yep. um, it's subject to a review. You don't have to sell it. You just have to review it. Okay. Um, and we would review the position and we all say, oh, it's fine. We'll keep it. Mm -hmm. And then in 30 days time, but we can only keep it for 30 days maximum. 30 days time, if it's still triggering, we, we, we will review it again. And then we will re review it again. Jeez, it's hard to say review lots of times. <laughs> um, and... Um, 
what ended up happening with Alibaba is it just kept triggering and we kept trying to work out what was wrong. And then after a while, we're like, look, this is the Chinese government. They're not, this isn't a one-off thing. They are yep. really cracking down here. And we have no idea what the earnings of this company are going to be. Um, so let's step to the sidelines. Yep. And so on the third trigger, we sold it completely, which was May 2021. And since then, the stock's fallen another 60%. So that, wow. that's a good option. Um, and then other good examples over the year. Another good example last year was PayPal. You know, we just didn't realize, we didn't recognize the competitive intensity it picked up. The trigger helped us recognize it because by the time it's on its second or third trigger, you know, like four or five guys at Munro are looking at this, trying to work out what the problem is. We're talking to everybody and, and finally, thankfully we worked it out in time and, and sold that company in January and it's since fallen another 50%. Mm. Yeah, it has been a bit of a one-way street for PayPal lately. Um, how Just before we get to portfolio construction, how often do you travel and how often are the analysts on the road or do you have people overseas? Yeah, so we actually have two people in Canada because we have a business in Canada, which 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 race which is we have money there, but they're money in a sales role. Um, we do all travel, yeah. I mean, so you got to get out to find out. Yeah. Um, you know, the reality is, is we all travelled extensively over the years. Um, obviously, COVID came along and created Zoom. We're very lucky to be here in Melbourne, actually near the big super funds, because the big super funds are now bringing their international money in-house. So a lot of the companies come to see us yeah, right. or did come to see us and have started coming to see us again. Um, and yeah, I've been to the States and Europe already this year. Um, and it's great to get back out there and see all the companies. And what's amazing is the CEOs want to come out as well because yeah. uh, they're lost. So yeah, from that point of view, you know, when you're trying to find these few winners, meeting them and, and understanding, you know, what their goal is on a long-term view is 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 invaluable. Mm. So, in terms of portfolio construction, um, you get down to these areas of interest, which we'll dig into a couple of them in just a moment. You get down to these areas of interest. How do you think about portfolio construction? And I guess maybe one interesting thing might be when you think about the areas of interest, do you look at things like the correlation between these themes and how they blend in a portfolio? Uh, yeah, so so what we don't do is do look at countries or sectors. I think you know it's it's pretty much a waste of time um, because the companies we're you know we're investing in are growing on big structural trends yep. around the world, and you know they're usually global businesses. Um, so what we're trying to do with the AOIs is build a number of different idiosyncratic structural growth areas that don't correlate with each other, mm. which is exactly your point. So so what shouldn't happen is you know if the climate bill in the US doesn't pass, for instance, that would affect our decarbonisation area, which is about 12% of the fund today, but it shouldn't affect the digital payment stocks, yeah. if that makes sense. And if if there's a crackdown on interchange fees, if that will affect the digital payment stocks, that shouldn't affect the healthcare companies, mm. um, which are benefiting from from other drivers around, you know, bio, biotech, et cetera. So they've all got different idiosyncratic growth drivers, so they shouldn't be too correlated to each other. But on top of that, there shouldn't be any one big change in the world that would hurt them. Yeah. yeah. How about um, the areas of interest? This is um, an area of interest for me, uh, is when you go about identifying these, how do you assess what is an area of interest by itself? Like how do you create a new one or how do you think about it? Are you looking at, are you just kind of building this network of, you know, feedback from CEOs, from industry and is that how you think about it or how do you kind of define those? Yeah, so it's all about just looking in the right place to find these great winners yeah. and then who are the companies that are leveraged to that and then they would evolve over time, okay? Yeah. So, right. so I'll give you a good example. We are on a podcast, okay? Yep. Podcasts didn't exist when we created the, the, you know, the digital advertising bucket. Yep. Uh, but the digital advertising bucket basically came from Google mm -hmm. and then Google led you to Facebook and then Facebook led you to all these other potential digital advertise winners like Spotify, yep. um, like um, in this area, like um, the Trade Desk, which is a DSP, which would which would put ads on your on yep. your on your podcast. And so so as we got to understand an area, we understood that that media would disintermediate dramatically and digitalize dramatically. And so the big winner out of this is the person who can feed ads into this really complicated structure, mm. and that ended up being the Trade Desk, yep. um, which we found four years after we built the digital advertising bucket. But mm. because we got to know it well, the more we looked at it, the more we led to these great ideas. Yeah. I like the trade desk. It's a really uh, neat uh, way of thinking about these areas of interest because it's kind of multiple themes and multiple structural growth drivers kind of layering on top of each other to support it. Um, do you ever, when you think about the industry and you think about the companies winning within it, 
how do you get a sense of who is winning? I, I saw a presentation that you did. I can't remember where it was, but you basically showed digital ads. And over time, I think you'd been, you'd been building this model for the area of interest since 2012. And you showed the shift towards digital away from like out of home and uh, TV, radio, et cetera. And um, I, I, the trade desk is a good example because how do you assess if it's growing or not? Are you looking at like industry revenue are you looking like how do you think about that to make yeah. sure that it's winning yeah it's a great question um so so we have a five test rule to, uh, sorry six test rule to to to, take, to to tell you which one's the great growth company so let's right. make this even easier okay so so the digital because because some people might know who the trade desk is but I'll, I'll get back to it but let's go back a bit further okay so digital advertising was literally like the the global advertising market is roughly 600 billion dollars per annum yep it grows at four percent per annum um, like GDP does, okay? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, you could buy advertising agencies who will try and kill each other and one of them will grow six and one of them will grow two because that's what they're fighting for. Anyway, along comes the internet and along comes <laughs> Google and, and digital advertising comes along. And so then it's the simple bet is, okay, so how much could digital advertising take from regular advertising? I, if you stop reading the newspaper, which we all don't do anymore, yep. and if you stop watching free-to-air TV, which... Few people... Few people still do. Yeah. Uh, and if you stop listening to the radio, how much could digital take? And at the time, we thought roughly 40% of all ad dollars could go to digital. So the $600 billion opportunity that's growing at 4% per annum, you know, ultimately digital advertising becomes like a $300 billion opportunity five years out if, yeah. you, if you do the maths. And so then you're like, okay, so who's going to win from that? Well, let's start with Google. Here's 11 search engines, right? Yep. And so you like to say it's rising tide lifts all boats, but it's not how digital works. It's when it takes most. So you have to pick the right one. So you're looking in the right area or not now, mm -hmm. and then you have to pick the right one. And so we find there's six characteristics of a great growth company. One is that they're, they're growing, revenue growth, their mm -hmm. earnings grow. They have this huge runway to grow into. In this case, it's digital advertising. So that's sustainable growth. The third one, fourth one is ESG. And then the last two are the super important ones, which is do you have a controlling shareholder or highly aligned management? And what's the customer perception of your business, right? So the two you can't mathematically work out are the two most important ones. Why? Because that leads you to the winner. Okay, so in the search engine case of all of those companies, only one of them still had their founder in place and, and their founder had control and that was Google. Um, if you look at the mobile phone example, the two companies won are the ones where the founders were still there. Apple and Samsung. Everyone else didn't quite get there. Yep. Nokia, Ericsson, Motorola, <laughs> yep. et cetera, et cetera. So those, that's a really important thing. On the digital advertising thing, it was Google, right? Then along comes Facebook. Again, the founder's there. And I know everyone hates it there, but at the time, everyone liked Facebook. So Facebook became the next wicket. So now you're into this full horrible landscape as to which podcast, what, 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 piece of media on and this is where the trade desk comes in and so the trade desk is a dsp it's a demand service provider it basically decides what the pre-roll is when you open an article on the age yeah um, and so they help everyone else catch up to google and facebook um, and again um jeff and i'm gonna forget his surname green green thank you is the ceo and founder of the trade desk and so he runs the best dsp and we did go to advertising agencies and ask them which dsps do you use and they all said Google has one DSP and the trade desk. Mm. And so that was the customer perception that we needed to basically say it was the trade desk. So the trade desk is a great example of digital ads and the transformation there. And you've spoken about this and I'll include links to some write-ups that you've done as well, um, talking about this area of interest. But the, if you go to your website, there are plenty of different areas of interest. If you could for a moment, um, maybe drill into say three of them and you, you kind of laid it out there of how you find the best expression within that industry or within that area of interest. Um, what are the three right now that are really interesting to you? Wow. How long's the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So look, the first and most obvious one is decarbonization. Um, so we are now irreversibly going to attempt to decarbonize the planet. Mm. Okay. Emphasis on the word attempt. <laughs> um, and why? Because every company in the world set a net zero target. Politics has got nothing to do with it. All the major corporations in the world have committed to net zero. They're science-based targets. They have to publish sustainability reports that report against it. Yep. We think it costs roughly 50 trillion to decarbonize the planet. I've seen numbers as high as 100 trillion. I know that's a lot of money, mm. but don't forget how much it's gonna cost if you don't decarbonize the planet. Um, 
And so from our point of view, that's 100 trillion or 50 trillion in revenue to the companies that provide the technologies to decarbonize the planet. And so that can be as simple as insulation in your six star rated building, which I'm currently <laughs> residing in one, um, or lighting in that building or, or, or heating, ventilation and cooling, your HVAC system. Or it could be, you know, like electric cars, battery technology, um, renewable technology, et cetera, hydrogen. And so this is a huge opportunity, uh, one that there's all these emerging businesses. Um, it's going to create these huge champions that we talked about. We've already got one, which is Tesla. And, and so this is like, this is a bit like the internet back in 1995. This is like, hmm. this is going to be the Wild West for a little while, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And so that would be the one, one I'd point to. Hmm. How about uh, companies, like I, I feel like maybe, maybe you do or don't have um, a perspective on this, but like ratings agencies and research houses that provide the research for, you know, sustainability reports, like what does this actually mean in the context of the industry? Um, have you ever looked at those? Yeah, 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 and we looked at them to the point where we went and hired our own ESG person. So yeah, right. We've hired uh, Mike Harut, who, who runs Responsible Investing here at Monroe Partners, mm -hmm. um, because we looked at those reports and they were good, but you know they weren't very thorough. Yep. Um, and and we think you know we we can build an edge here, so we can do our own ESG, get to understand the companies who are the true champions on the ESG side, which means they'll get a higher multiple, mm -hmm. but then also lead us towards these decarbonization champions as well. And yeah, so, so that's why we looked at that area and it's also why we launched our climate fund. Yeah. So, so the Monroe Climate Leaders Fund, which is listed on the exchange, there's a plug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, we set up a standalone fund for this because we think we're right at the start of this. And so we think it's a good opportunity. People shouldn't put all their money in it, by the way. It is a, <laughs> it is, you know, a thematic right. investment. It's not meant to be a replacement for your global equities, but, um, but for, from our point of view that's why we like this one a lot i think there's a lot of edge we can build here in the next 10 years yeah great and that's a pretty exciting thing not just for investors for for everyone that listens to this podcast and hears that they're thinking well this is um people tend to think that you know decarbonization and net zero targets are, are going to cost my company's money it's going to in my profits my dividends etc cetera, etc cetera. but it actually creates an, a kind of thematic or an industry within itself that where companies can thrive um so that's that's one. We've got decarbonization. Have you got two more? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Second one, fairly simple, would be healthcare. I mean, look, it's 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 a great area that we like a lot at the moment. Um, biologics drugs. Um, you know, people would remember that. You know, if you if you got your Pfizer, uh, Pfizer was an mnra drug. AstraZeneca wasn't. Yep. Um, you know, the reality is the mnras worked better. You know, this is a you know biologics at work. Um, this is going to keep coming. Um, and so from our point of view, it's a really exciting time to be looking at these drugs and the, the way they're using technology to, to synthesize things. I mean, the, my favorite story about Pfizer, having seen them, and, and Moderna, you know, they actually had the, the, the COVID vaccine synthesized within four days of yeah, effectively well. being discovered. And the next two years was basically getting approved and built. Hmm. Um, so just think about that for other diseases, um, things like malaria and, and other stuff that they can do now. So that's super exciting. We like biologics and we... Yes, it's the companies that create them, but more importantly, you can just buy the weapons manufacturers in this or the shovels in the boom. You can just buy the people that make biologic machines, uh, I, the vats that you make these things, the, the vats that you have to grow the, grow the cultures in. And so this is a big structural trend where clearly biologics take share from regular drugs um, and our job is to find the big winners here. Mm. And, and companies like Danaher and Thermo Fisher are ones we like quite a lot there. Fantastic. We could probably blend these new questions, these next two questions together, which is... Um, so it's a bit topical at the moment, not to time stamp the conversation too much. Um, there's a lot of you know geopolitics going on in the Asia region, Taiwan, China, yep. USA, et cetera, everyone getting in the mix there. And in amongst all that, we've got semiconductors, we've got chips. And one of the, the companies that are in your is in your portfolio is ASML, uh, which is a business that for many people, they kind of try to take it in and it's a bit unwieldy, like it's a bit complicated. They don't understand how this all fits. Can you kind of give us the thesis for that and kind of wrapped around the industry structure as well? Yeah, so remember when we talked about big structural changes to find big structurally growing winners. So yep. decarbonisation, obvious one. Healthcare, biologics, another obvious one. Uh, for us, semiconductors is, 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 is an obvious one as well, but maybe less obvious to the readers, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the listeners, sorry. Um, so from our point of view, you know, the reality is, 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 is if digitalization is the most important thing for every business in the world to beat its competitors, then digitalization at its core is how fast your computer goes. Mm. Whoever's got the fastest computers wins. 
Um, and, and to make computers faster, you need semiconductors uh, and particularly high-performance semiconductors or it's called high-performance computing and this is why I talked about NVIDIA at the start. Um, and so from that point of view, the people who can provide high-performance computing are the people who are literally the most important component you have in your business and it doesn't really matter what your business is today. Mm. Um, how high-performance computing is done is done through shrink, okay? So, so some people on the podcast would understand Moore's Law you know, back in 1971, you know, Gordon Moore at Intel, and God, I bet they wish he was still there. Um, <laughs> put um, 2,000 transistors on a on a on a on a on an integrated circuit, and every year he worked out he could get from 2,000 to 4,000, 4,000 to 8,000, 8,000 to 16,000, 16 to 32. Um, and what that did was make computers faster, but also made them cheaper. So what would happen is is computers went from like a big box at NASA into a personal computer, into a mobile phone, into the internet, into digitalization. And so every development that we've had in the world in the last 40 years relies on this equation, i.e. because computers got faster and cheaper, which eventually meant we could do Zoom, we could do all these things. So, so Netflix, Zoom, Amazon, all these companies are successful because they exploited this equation. Mm. And so the companies that create this shrink, so last year, Jensen Wong at NVIDIA put 80 billion transistors on an integrated circuit. So that's where we're up to, right? Hmm. So 80 billion, and he did that because ASML sells a lithography machine, AS, a machine that makes a stencil that allows you to do this down to nanometers, if that makes sense. And this machine is the most important machine in the world because it drives this equation. Uh, everyone else has given up trying to get shrink. Everyone's trying to roll when it runs out. ASML is the only one who can do it, so it's a monopoly on the lithography machine. Those lithography machines mainly go to Taiwan because TSMC makes most of them, but Intel does and so does Samsung as well. And the machine costs 168 million euros. Um, <laughs> it's about the size of a bus. And there's a bigger one coming that's going to cost about 360 million euros. And so from our point of view, ASML is the most important company in the world that most people have never heard of. Mm. So this is a business that's based in Europe, right? The Netherlands. Yeah, Netherlands. Um, and it's one of the, it is the only business that can get chips effectively down to three to five nanometers. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're at five nanometers at the moment. And then we're going to go to three. Then we go to like two and a half. Then we go to one and then we're done. Yeah, right. And then we have to stack them all on top of each other or, or ASML is going to have to come up with something else. Yeah, right. I so, don't think we can actually get to one. I think we can only get to 1.5. Right. So this is a technology that is so difficult to replicate um, and that's evident by this as one company and it's now the kind of, I would say, the backbone of this geopolitical unrest in the region because TSMC creates, I don't know, maybe you know how, how, how much of a percentage of the... About 80%. The, yeah. And so that's a... That's a like a lot of concentration on this vital uh, technology in one area. Uh, I think it was announced recently that the US would be investing, the government would be investing a few hundred billion dollars into trying to do their own like foundries and things in the United States. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. And so, so what's exciting? I mean, yeah, so now the world's woken up to this point that these chips are really important. Yeah. Um, and so NVIDIA, who makes the best ones, or, or AMD, um, also makes the best ones. Um, they they outsource their production to TSMC. TSMC is a foundry in Taiwan, or they outsource it to Samsung in Korea. And so that's where they're all made, all the really high-end ones. Why? Because these ASML machines cost so much money that everyone mm. else gave up. Yep. Um, Global Foundries and UMC, all these other guys, they just make dumb chips. They make the chips that go in your car or your camera or your phone. But the really high-end ones are made by these two foundries. And one of them, 80% of them are made in Taiwan, which happens to be a disputed territory between China and the rest of the world. So like mass panic kicks in globally once people work this out. Um, this is why Taiwan becomes the new Middle East effectively and geopolitically becomes very important because high-performance computing chips are the new oil, in our opinion. Mm. So we don't really mind what happens in the Middle East anymore because we don't need oil like we used to. We need this stuff. So Taiwan becomes important. Everyone turns up there. China gets angry. Um, on top of that, you know, those nice EUV machines, the Americans say actually to the Dutch, you can't sell them to the Chinese. So they've, they've, they can't get access to the technology. Uh, why? Because they're used to make high-performance semiconductors for US defense. So they've enacted the Defense Act and the most machines don't get to China. And now they've enacted the CHIPS Act because they're like, we better start building this stuff onshore. And so, yes, $250 billion of loans to build foundries in Ohio, in Arizona. Germany's doing the same and so is Japan. So who wins? 
ASML because these EUV mm. machines now have to go everywhere so people can diversify the source of these high-performance semiconductors. And so you said they sell these machines like a size of a bus and so one of them, a bigger one's coming. Is that the is that the business model? Is there a more effective way to sell that? Do you think? Do you think they could maybe transition that into you know a subscription type model, but on a massive scale? So they do sell software with the machine, um, and the software does help. Uh, but yeah, most there's only really a couple of companies in the world that can afford to buy them um, in scale because you have to buy like ten or fifteen a year. <laughs> um, and, and so from that point of view, yeah, they, they, they only really have three customers for these machines. They do sell other machines, the dumber machines as well, um, which they do sell to the Chinese and other places. Um, but yeah, there's three customers and they sell them with hardware and software. But the real question now for ASML is we can see the opportunity in front of them for the next decade. You know, who's going who's gonna to come up? And we, we've got shrink going for the next decade, which is great. Because if you think about it, every two years is another node and means every computer in the world is going to get somewhere between 20 and 40 times more powerful. Mm. So there's a lot of fun stuff still to come. But they've got to think about how do we get beyond 2030? How do we do shrink beyond that? Yeah, that's a, I guess that's an exciting thing to keep a, keep a watch on if you're an investor. Well, that's where you know, we get to talk about quantum computing and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and please don't go there because we'll, we'll add another half an hour. To <laughs> okay, maybe, for, maybe next time. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got one, um, one more question here. And this is something we just spoke off air about it. Um, there was an, an article about cash in the, the Monroe portfolio and being in a bear market now, um, I'm – you, you, in, I think it was your annual letter, you laid out a few things that you're waiting for and to see in markets before you kind of come back in and come back in in a, in a big way. Uh, can you cover off those for us? And I think maybe the context around the long short also makes sense, like when we're talking off air. Yep. Um, to add some context to it. Yeah, okay. So so we run, as I said, three funds at Munro. Two of them are long only, so they're fully invested all the time. Yep. Um, and they have like small cash balances. And the Absolute Return Fund, which is the double-digit returns that we're trying to achieve for our clients, has the ability to raise cash. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, a little bit late, about the second week of January, we realized that, um, but, uh, you know, that we were going into a difficult period. Um, and we raised about 40% cash in that fund. Mm -hmm. And we've been sitting on that cash ever since. And so everyone's <laughs> been asking us, when do you put the cash back to work? And, you know, if I could go back to January, I would have raised a lot more, quite frankly. Um, you know, it's been a bad, it's been a tough first half of the year. And I think most people listening would be aware of that. Um, why did it happen? Look, it happened because COVID just went away faster than we thought it would. Uh, every central bank left everything too loose for too long. Um, we all went away over Christmas. Omicron came along. Everyone got COVID. You came back, realised COVID was over. Mm. Uh, by June, we're all on aeroplanes around Europe or back traveling again. Life just went back to normal really fast. Um, so what the central banks had to do was take all the stimulus out really quickly. And they, they should have taken it out last year. They didn't. You can understand why they got behind the curve. And so we've been going through this period of rapid rate rises. Those rapid rate rises cause an economic slowdown and the market's priced it in. He's been pricing it in for basically six months. Um, from our point of view, to get to the end of this process, you need, you know, you need three things to happen. Um, and the first one has probably already happened, which is that rates have to peak. So you have to get, central banks have to get to a level that they're happy with. Uh, and at the moment, it's 2.5% in the US, and the long bond in the US is trading around 2.7. So the, the, market, the bond market's saying that maybe they've only got a couple more rate hikes in them. Mm -hmm. That's important because that was causing the derating. So growth equities were the first thing to get sold off. Um, why? Because if the risk-free rate goes up, your multiple goes down because it's a long duration asset. You discounted cash flow. You were stuffing around. You were, some of us may have hoped and some things were being priced on 0% interest rates forever. Um, in the end, you know, that didn't, didn't pan out. So that was the first bad thing that happened. The second bad thing that is still to happen is the earnings need to go down. So these rates have gone up. So we're going to have an economic slowdown. We don't really know how big it is. And the third thing is time. You know, generally bear markets last anywhere between six and 18 months. This one's coming into its eight months. Um, and so generally it pays to be a little bit prudent at this time because, you know, you know, people, it's when the tide goes out, you, you know, you don't, you notice who's not wearing a bathing suit, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, as, as Warren would say. Um, so from our point of view, you know, one and a half of those things have happened, um, was what I was trying to say, was the long bonds have peaked and we're eight months through this thing. So, mm. you know, and there's still some bad things that can happen from here. So you need to be prudent. 
Uh, but you also need to recognize that you've got one and a half of them done. And so what I was trying to say, somewhat unsuccessfully, um, that is if you've got 100 bucks on the sidelines at the moment, you probably want to be spending 30 of it. Yeah, right. And you want to spend it on growth equities that you know can get through the economic slowdown. So the, the, the D ratings happened, but the, down, the slowdown's coming. We have no idea how big it's going to be. We have no idea what could go wrong next. But those companies that can grow through this you know, you, you probably want to be starting to nibble away at them. Well, in those uh, areas of interest, if there's structural growth, that underpins some of that, right? Because they're not just growing for the sake of it. They're taking share from other industries and and coming through. Correct, yeah. So if your earnings are not going to go down because of the slowdown and your multiple just halved, then that's a pretty good opportunity. Mm. Um, and so you should start looking at those things. So ASML is a good example here. Like mm. people are worried about its semiconductor business. But it has these other structural drivers that will, will drive through it. Um, Microsoft's a great example here where, you know, not many people are going to turn it off no matter how bad this gets. Yeah. Um, cloud computing's growing at 40%. It'll probably still grow at that. And so they've just been through this big derating because of interest rates. But if interest rates have stopped derating, then those stocks have probably stopped going down. Mm. But for the other parts of the market where, you know, if you're a bank or you're a commodity company or – or you're an industrial, we don't know how bad this slowdown is going to be. It's hard to see the other side of the valley at the moment. And so they they don't look attractive just yet. Yep, that's really interesting. Um, just one question uh, about ASML, if I, if I may, is with the geopolitical risk, um, how would you measure that in terms of knowing if you're wrong? So um, say, for example, like it gets more heated. In, yeah, it's 100%. In time. Yeah. yeah, so so what's the massive thing that goes wrong with ASML? <laughs> China invades Taiwan. You know, TSMC mm. is their largest customer. Mm. It would be a disaster. Yeah. Um, so our high-performance compute bet in the fund is, is 10%. Yeah. Um, and okay. remember I talked about lots of idiosyncratic things yeah. that could go wrong. You know, the big one that goes wrong there is China invades Taiwan. Yeah. And those companies will go down a lot, uh, but it is 10% of the fund. Yeah. Um, and but it shouldn't. It will affect the whole market, quite frankly. Yeah. But it shouldn't, you know, hurt our healthcare companies as much, or or the digital payments companies as much. But but it would hurt those companies, yes. Mm. Yeah, I think that's well. That's that's good because we um we we kind of give people a sense of not only the counterpoint, what could go wrong, but also it's uh, the context matters here too, right? A lot of times, fund managers or anyone could come onto a, some sort of media outlet, and it's taken out of context, and we take one thing to say, you know. Oh, you know, it's good, it's bad. It's kind of like a binary outcome. But when you say oh, it's temp, that whole area of interest is ten percent. Yeah, and I think that context is really important. So, final question, Nick: uh, If you could go back to a twenty-year-old version of yourself, what would you tell yourself about money, finance, or investing, or even business? Oh, geez, I can tell myself so many things. Is it one? Or you a can keep, go for it. Free reign. Uh, okay, so so the the first one I just say is, is it's important to be nice to people. Quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I talked about a journey through through different firms, different places where, you know, at any time I could have lost my seat in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to be nice to people along the way because all those friends are the ones that help you when you get to the other side. And those relationships are, the, are just really, it is a relationship business at the end of the day. And, and that's been very important to my journey. Um, from a funds management perspective, um, the most important thing to know is when you're wrong. Mm. Um, you're going to be wrong a lot. It's okay. Just deal with it. And don't, don't you know, discipline outweighs conviction 99.9% .9 mm. of the time, okay? So, so have some sort of discipline to help you realize that you're wrong. I've, I've talked a bit about ours. Uh, but you're going to make mistakes. It's fine. There's only a few bank win winners. You want to run them for a long period of time. What you don't want to do is is die in a ditch on BlackBerry. You could still hold your BlackBerry shares today because you thought the keyboard was going to be better than the touchscreen. Well, guess what? It wasn't, okay? Hmm. Apple was the winner. Recognize the mistake. Sell the BlackBerry. Buy the Apple. Mm. Um, and the faster you do that, the more money you'll make. I really like it. I think you're the first person that's ever brought in BlackBerry in that final <laughs> final question. So uh, that's, that's great, mate. Um, and just to, for our listeners uh, and viewers, links to Munro Fund's will be available in the show notes. There's ETF forms and there's unlisted funds as well. Um, is there any? What is there a minimum on the unlisted funds? Um, there is, but we get, it's 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 twenty thousand dollars. But we can't even waive it if you if we if we want to. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, wonderful. Well, Nick, thanks for taking some time to join me on the show. I really appreciate it. No, thanks very much for having me on.
Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.